Acts chapter 2, 1 to 16. My question to you today, before we turn to our text, is this. What was it about early Christianity that spread like wildfire throughout the Mediterranean world? <clears throat> what makes Christianity world's largest religion today, with 33% or so of the world's population, and about 2.3 something billion believers across the world? What made Christianity in China explode when the communist Maoist regime kicked out all the foreign missionaries, locked its doors. What made 50 million Chinese people Christians when there are no missionaries? For most Christians, the word Pentecost reminds us of speaking in unknown tongues gibberish tongues, as it is known in some Christian circles today. But how are we to understand this phenom phenomenon, this strange phenomenon? Is speaking in unknown tongues a right understanding of this text? One thing is clear from this passage, Pentecost is the day the Holy Spirit came with spiritual power upon the disciples. And so here are the three insights on the work of the Holy Spirit from our passage today. Number one, the Spirit gives us power to witness. Number two, the Spirit opens our ears to hear. <laughs> Number three, the Spirit shows us the risen Savior. So from our passage, these are things we're going to see. Number one, the Spirit gives us power to witness. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, like we're doing now. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost arrive, they were together in one place. Uh, the word Pentecost is the 58th day, that's what it means, the 58th day after the Jewish Passover festival. In the Jewish calendar, Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks, we see that in Leviticus chapter 23, or the Feast of the Harvest, as we see in Exodus 23. Uh, it was a day of joyous celebration of the wheat harvest. It was a celebration of harvesting. Keep that in mind. It was a day that God told the Israelites to really recall, to really remember how they were slaves in Egypt. The festival uh, also eventually came to be associated with the covenant that God made with Noah and Moses. And... Uh, in the Second Temple, Jeru uh, in the Second Temple Ju Judaism, it was known as the day when God gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. And so, before we move further, I have a question: Have you ever felt powerless for the mission that Jesus has for you? Because I have. Many times I have shared the gospel. I've lived in Japan for <laughs> close to 17 years now, basically this year, 17 years, and I have felt powerless in my witness in Christ. And I raised this with some brothers and said, why is it, I, when I talk with other pastors, why is it that my gospel witnessing has so little power? Am I preaching the same gospel as the apostles? That's what I've been asking. Now, doctrinally, I don't doubt that I'm preaching the right doctrine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things like people like Martin Lloyd-Jones have been speaking about when he says the baptism in the Spirit and it, he says it in a different way than you know, other branches of Pentecostalism or the Charismatics would say it. And this was British 20th century preacher, right? Uh, 19th century, late 19th, 20th century preacher, uh, evangelical Martin Lloyd-Jones, a very sound preacher in Britain. And so I'm asking myself, and I've asked pastor, and I've said, why is it that my preaching in Japan has so little power and I'm, I, I'm fed up with myself. <laughs> so 
So I'm not beating myself up. Jesus measured up for me, right? But I'm asking myself seriously. You ought to ask yourself this question. Why is your Christian witness so powerless? Have you ever asked yourself that? Because if you haven't asked, then something is wrong with you. Something is very wrong. You're not reading your Bible correctly. I'm going to challenge you with that. So are you, have you ever felt powerless for the mission that Jesus has for you? Because if you feel up to it, then something is wrong. You're confident with yourself. And the Holy Spirit will often tear that down. 17 years in Japan has stripped down those kind of prideful confidence that I had as a young pastor. When I was an assistant pastor, I, I was really cocky. I, I didn't know. I couldn't see this, right? right? I can only see it like 10 years later. And that's the painful part. <laughs> painful part is I, could look, I can look back and see that, that young, arrogant fool. <laughs> you know? but, and right now, what will ha- what's happening is that the Holy Spirit does this kind of stuff. It's called sanctification. So I'm 42, 43. When I turn 50, I'm going to look at my 43-year-old self and say, what a fool. Because it means sanctification. Your sanctification, you've grown in your wisdom. You've matured, that's what it means. And therefore, you're able to look back at your old immature self and say, what a fool. The only problem is I can't realize that right now. That's the blindness. That's the blindness of sin. Where am I going with this? Because when the day of Pentecost arrived, something happened. The third person of the Trinity that Jesus has been talking about in John chapter 15, 14, John chapter 12. The spirit of truth is going to come, right? And so, remember Acts was written by Luke, uh, the disciple of Jesus. At the end of Luke 24, Jesus had said to his disciples, Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus is resurrected. Wait for the promise of the Father. Stay in the city in Jerusalem until, don't go without this, until you are clothed with power from on high, Jesus says in Luke. Again in Acts 1, which is written by Luke, verse 4, Jesus had told them not to depart from Jerusalem. But as, and he says, but to wait for the promise of the Father. See, it was very, very important that they waited for the promised Holy Spirit, the power from on high. And so, when the day of Pentecost had finally arrived in verse 2, it says, notice, suddenly there came from heaven. Notice it says that the Spirit came suddenly. Back in Mount Sinai, God had given His law to Israel, but on Pentecost, God pours out His Spirit upon his people. So if you are new to the Christian faith, maybe you have friends that are new to Christianity, here again we see the difference between other religions and Christianity. Every major religion says you must do this and that to be in heaven with God. But Christianity says God has come down from heaven. Much like in the incarnation, the Holy Spirit has come down from heaven, it says. It says the Spirit of God came suddenly Uh, Suddenly, it says, there came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And again, this was not a literal wind, right? When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in uh, John 3, 8, he says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The wind blows where, where it pleases. Wherever it pleases, you hear the sound, you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, Jesus says. Jesus says, you can control this. It came suddenly. The Holy Spirit cannot be manipulated, controlled. He's sovereign. He does whatever He pleases. He's the third person of the Trinity. He works whenever He wants. He cannot be controlled. But there's one thing we need to see. We can pray for the Holy Spirit as they were doing, right? Um, Wind here means spirit. It also means breath. Uh, And so this reminds us again that Christianity is in a suffocating and stifling religion. If your Christian life is stifling, you need to question that, right? Christianity is in a suffocating and stifling religion. God is a life-giving spirit. The third person of the Trinity is a life-giving spirit. And as Jesus said in John, in John's gospel, he has come to convict. That's his primary work. That's why I was telling you about how stupid I I, I am right now and I, I don't realize it. <laughs> because the spirit convicts us of the foolishness of sin. Sin turns us into foolish people. 
And so here we see, however, that the Spirit has come to rest upon the disciples, to empower them, and He came suddenly. He suddenly blew like a wind that day, right? And uh, uh, we can pray f- we can pray for the Holy Spirit as they were doing in chapter 1, verse 14. But here is what we see here, that the Spirit is free to do as He pleases. So He came suddenly as a rushing wind. And notice what happens next. Verse 3 says, Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. The Holy Spirit has come to rest on each one of them. Incredible. Now, do you see the word fire here? It says tongues of fire. Uh, In the Old Testament, fire was a sign of God's presence. For example, in Exodus 19, uh, Mount Sinai was wrapped up in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire, it says. Right? Fire means that God's presence or God's... It always means that God was present. It also means that... It also refers to God's judgment and purification of His people. But back in Exodus 3, stay with me here. When God appeared to Moses, what happened? The bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. (laughs) And so here we see that the tongues of fire had come to rest on the disciples without burning burning them up. Right? This is very, very important because this was not a literal fire. Uh, What's happening here? We see wind and fire. And then in the Old Testament, we saw cloud and flame when God led the Israelites. And God's presence that rested over the tabernacle also filled the temple in the Old Testament. And that same spirit now rests over the disciples. Incredible. God has come to tabernacle with his people, to indwell his sinners with his spirit. <laughs> this is a miracle because Christianity 101, okay, the Holy Spirit, maybe you grew up, grew up in whatever country you come from where Christianity is so common, you grew up with this. But for me, as I was studying this, it blew my mind that this is a miracle that the third person of the Trinity would come and take up his residence in this body. It's a miracle. If that doesn't blow your mind away, gosh, you got to spend the rest of your life trying to wrap um, your mind around this. This is amazing. I was awed to realize that, that, that the Holy Spirit that, uh, that was in the Old Covenant, right? That was in the temple, that filled the temple, and the, that rested over the tabernacle, now comes on Pentecost Day to be inside God's people, to live. He is now resting upon them. The Holy God now comes to fill and indwell sinners because this is after the resurrection. Jesus has risen from the dead. And just as He said He would send the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit has come. God has come to live inside His people. This is a miracle. Wait, let me say that again. God God has come to live inside His people. This should change the way how a Christian lives. I don't have time to go into Paul's letters. The letters of Paul are replete with what it means to have the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. This is amazing. The power from on high that Jesus promised now fills His people. So verse 4 says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Judaism could not fulfill them. Man-made religion cannot fill you. It's powerless and empty. Every other pursuit in life eventually leaves you empty if you make that into an ultimate thing. But the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, has come to fill His people. He has come to rest on them, indwell them, fill them. Right? It means this. To be filled with the Spirit means you never have to be empty again. Uh, Your life doesn't have to be dry, powerless, unfulfilled, and restless, and and lifeless all the time. we, We can be free from lifeless, formal Christian religion. We can be free from this. Right? We can finally have the freedom to walk in the Spirit. 
The fullness of the Spirit is now available to all believers. And so what is the result of being filled here? It says, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I was asking you, do you feel that your witness is powerless? Are you a fearful and timid and shy Christian? <laughs> because the weak and fearful disciples are now speaking boldly as the Spirit enables them. The Holy Spirit has come to rest upon us, indwell us, fill us, and give us the boldness to speak. And so next we see the Spirit opens our ears to hear. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were be bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belong to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. Wow. We hear them telling in our own tongues, our mother tongues, the mighty works of God, the wondrous works of God. Remember that Jerusalem was crowded with Jewish visitors. These are Jewish diasporas who are spread across the Mediterranean world. And now they're coming to the day of Pentecost to celebrate that day. Verse 5 says, There were many devout men, notice, from every nation under heaven. That word nation is ethnos. That's where we get ethno-linguistic words, you know, ethno-linguistic people groups. Uh, ethnic, the ethnic groups, the nations were there. See, every nation was represented here, much like the nations are represented here at the Bridge Fellowship and in Tokyo. And... How many of you realize, so often when we gather, we use a bridge language, like English. English is a bridge language, yes, all across the world. Or in Japan, you're bilingual and you use Japanese language. And uh, uh, to understand one another, to make sense of what we are saying. And so here's my question to you. What if, what if people who have never studied your language suddenly speak to you in your mother tongue? What if... People who have never ever studied your language suddenly speak to you in your mother tongue. Because that's what happened here. Verse 6 says, They were confused and surprised because each one was hearing them speak in his own native language. Uh, do you remember? This is important. Uh, how, in verse 4, the disciples were speaking other tongues. Verse 6 says, They understood the tongues here. The na in their native language. This was a miraculous tongue, but it made complete sense to others in their native language. It was not gibberish, right? It was, it was not, sorry to say it, but abracadabra, you know, kind of, and they, the others didn't understand. No, this made sense. It was a miraculous tongue. The Holy Spirit gave sense, and people understood this. And so uh, the Spirit gave them utterance in verse 4, and the Spirit gives the hearers understanding. Notice verse 7 says, They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it? How is it that each of us uh, are hearing this in our own native language? They were saying, How could you Galileans speak our native language? This is miraculous. And see, before we talk about the content of what they were saying, look at this. The Holy Spirit speaks your heart language. God is the author of every nation and language that were gathered here. In verse 9, we see this long list, like the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites, and all the way down to Cretans and Arabians in verse 10. This is incredible, right? This was the beginning of the first multi-ethnic, multilingual international church. This was the birth of this wonderful international church. Do you remember... The Tower of Babel. How many of you know the story of Babel? Yeah? In Genesis 11, in the Old Testament. See, Pentecost is a total reversal of what happened at Babel. At the Tower of Babel, people wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted a tower that was reaching up to heaven. 
But on Pentecost, the Spirit came down and brought every nation under heaven. At Babel, tongues, languages were confused. But on Pentecost, the nations heard the gospel in their native languages, right? So at Babel, the languages were confused. But on Pentecost, the nations heard the gospel, the wonders of God in their native languages. This is why in the church you'll find people from all nations and backgrounds we, that have only one thing in common. See, the Holy Spirit has come to make us into this one people from every nation under heaven. He has come to unite people of different colors and races who otherwise would have been natural enemies. <laughs> okay, so... The church is made up of people from every tribe, language, and nation under heaven who otherwise would never get along elsewhere. Why? The gospel unites us. That's why we get along. The gospel brings us together. The wonders of God brings us together, as we will see. And see, He has come, the Spirit has come to unite people of different colors, right? And races who otherwise would never have gotten along. And so what happened as they heard the gospel? Sorry, as they heard the disciples speak in verse 7 and verse 11. It says this. They were amazed and astound, astonished and they said, What? We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. See, when the gospel is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit opens our ears to hear and he awakens wonder and amazement. The Holy Spirit creates in us a great sense of inner wonder as we hear. This is a kind of hearing that does... There, see, there is a kind of hearing that does not hear with faith. Right? So my question to you today is, are you amazed at the mighty works of God? And let me ask this way. When was the last time you sat down opening your Bible and really got amazed at the mighty words of God. Was there an inner sense of wonder? Or was the Bible reading kind of dry, more academic reading, you know, surface level reading? Or did you feel like that God was present, that there was this amazement and wonder at what He has done, the works of God? This is important because on that day there was this amazement and wonder there is an inner one. There was an inner wonder. Like if see, if you are not amazed at the work of God, what happens is you'll be amazed at something else that is not God. <laughs> That's how the human works. It's by default. You always run to something else. You're more amazed of that thing other than God Himself. That's called idolatry. So apart from God, the God's Spirit working in our heart, pointing our direction to the right place to worship God in amazement. That's what happens to us. And so, the whole point of this experience was not the miraculous tongues, as great as this was. They said in verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues the wonders of God, the mighty words of God. They were praising God on the day, literally, actually. And so they heard the wondrous works of God. The disciples were not telling their own works, by the way. They were not telling what they have done. They were telling the mighty works of God, not their works. Later in chapter Acts 10, verse 46, it says, For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. They were praising God. They were talking about the wondrous praise of God. And the nations were hearing this and they were amazed. They were praising God and others were amazed as they heard the wonders of God. Do you see the difference here? Uh, that these disciples were not talking about their own works but the works of God. They were not speaking about themselves, but the works of God. Because that's where the power is. This is where the power is. And this is what amazes the heart of the hearers. See, Christianity is not primarily about what we do for God. It's mainly about the works God has done for us. Christianity is not primarily the works that we do for God. Christianity is primarily about the works that God has done for us. God is doing in us. God is doing through us. There's a difference, right? See, if we have experienced the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, 
I'm asking myself, how, how can I possibly keep silent about the wondrous works of God? If I have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, how can I possibly keep silent about the wonders of God? Because it will result in praising the wonders of God. If we have seen the mighty works of God, we won't be able to keep silent about it. Your heart, your mouth speaks what your heart loves. Your mouth naturally commends that which your heart loves most. Let me say it again. My mouth commends to others what I am naturally inclined to love. So if my heart is captivated by something and I find that the mountain there is, Mount Fuji is beautiful, what do I say? My wife doesn't need to tell me, say Mount Fuji is beautiful, say Mount Fuji is beautiful, say Mount Fuji is beautiful. That's what you say to a kid. And they say, Mount Fuji is beautiful. No. How do I know Mount Fuji is beautiful? My eyes saw the grandeur of Mount Fuji and what my mouth says. It's beautiful. You got up in the morning, the sun ro rose, and then what did you say? Beautiful day. Your eyes saw the beautiful day, and you said, beautiful day. Your mouth commands what your heart loves. The Holy Spirit came upon the people, opens the eyes of their understanding, their hearts, they were amazed. And then they heard the apostles who were also amazed and speaking the wonders of God. Incredible. It was natural. It's a natural response. Our hearts were made like that. God made us to be that way, right? And so if we have seen the mighty works of God, we won't keep silent about them. When you taste sushi, you say, sushi is tasty. Nobody need to tell you sushi is tasty because you've tasted it. It would be so foolish for me to come and say as your pastor, tell it to your non-Christian friends, sushi is tasty, sushi is tasty. Sunday after Sunday, go tell your non-Christian friends, sushi is tasty, sushi is tasty. No, if the good news of God is good news to you, you won't keep silent. You won't keep silent. It's a natural response to the experience of God's grace. Praise is the natural response to the experience of God's grace in your heart, not in your head. So, the Holy Spirit has come to show us the wonders of God so that we might tell it to the nations. They were amazed and said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty words of God. Where are the mighty words of God? See, where are the mighty words of God powerfully seen? The mighty works of God are powerfully seen on the work of Christ on the cross. And so finally we see the Spirit shows us the risen Savior. And all we are amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking says, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since this is only, only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered to the prophet Joel. Now, notice verse 12 says, All were amazed and confused. So others were amazed, but others were confused, saying, What does this mean? While they could hear their, uh, this in their own language, they did not fully understand the meaning. And so, uh, this is why I was telling you, sometimes I feel my witnessing is so powerless, not, sometimes it's not because they didn't understand the message in their language or they didn't understand what, I was what you were communicating. It's because of this that unless the Spirit opens up the eyes of their understanding, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, said the Apostle Paul. That is there. And so while they could hear this in their own language, they did not fully understand the meaning. And so if you are new to Christianity, see you, you may be wondering, what does this mean? Do you see two types of responses here? Some people were seriously asking, what does this mean? And then the other group, what happened? We're mocking. We'll come to that. See, these people were saying, what does this mean? And I love this because they wanted an explanation of the phenomenon. They were not satisfied with just the religious frenzy, what they, that they saw. They were not satisfied with the f strange phenomenon that they saw. They wanted an explanation. The spirit is the spirit of truth. They want the truth. They wanted more teaching. There are people who really, really wanted to know more. And so, if you're new and you're seeking to understand the Christian faith, look, 
We love to listen and answer your questions. We are not afraid of any difficult questions, by the way. See, these honest hearers wanted more answers. They said, what does this mean? Right? And later in verse 41, we see that under Peter's preaching, biblical preaching, 3,000 souls were saved that day. But others here in verse 13 said, they were making fun of them and saying, they are filled with new wine. These people are drunk. Right? See, let me just say this. It's very, very easy to mock the things of God we don't understand. It's very easy to mock and write off the things of God we don't understand. It's actually intellectually dishonest to mock Christianity without seeking to understand more. Because the natural mind does not easily understand the supernatural things of the spirit. It's easier to arrive at our own conclusions about spiritual things we don't quite understand or what we haven't experienced. They are drunk with new wine. Point our fingers and say, arrive at your own conclusion. They are drunk with new wine. Find a natural explanation. They are drunk with new wine. Easier to do that. Right? so easy to do that. And they were mocking, right? It's easier to arrive at these conclusions about spiritual things we don't understand. And so, or you can join the crowd that honestly asks this question. What does this mean? I want to know more. I want to learn more about the Christian faith. I want to understand this phenomenon. That's a humble approach. So Jewish unbelievers here were mocking and saying they have had too much wine. But now, notice how Peter responds. He says in verse 15, For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. <laughs> I love Peter because he gives a common sense explanation <laughs> to their common sense answers. Like, common sense. They are drunk. And Peter says, this is, it's too early to be drunk. This is common sense. It's the third hour of the day. This is around 9 a.m. in the morning, right? And so Peter gives his common sense explanation. And then in verse 16, he comes and opens the Old Testament. And he says this, But this, this phenomenon, was what was uttered to the prophet Joel. See, at this point, Peter quotes prophet Joel's prophecy about the coming of the day of the Lord. In the prophecy down there in verse 17 to 21, we see the pouring of the Holy Spirit. How Joel talks about how the Spirit will be poured out in the last days. He talks about how the pouring of the Spirit is accompanied by signs and wonders in the sky and on earth. And before the judgment falls on the nations, because the nations were oppressing God's people, the Israelites, and so before the judgment falls on the nations, Peter says this, down in verse 21, same chapter, down in verse 21, he says, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Instead of judgment, there will be a time of grace where he says, Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that saves according to prophet Joel? Who is the Lord in prophet Joel's prophecy? And Peter says this, track with me in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So I ask you this question. What is the most important thing about Pentecost? If you are a Pentecostal Christian, I ask you this question. What is the most important thing about Pentecost? Answer me. The most important thing was not the tongues of fire, it, though it was a remarkable sign. The most important thing was not the miraculous languages, though it was uh, great. The most important thing was what Joel's prophecy said, 800 years before Christ. And that was pointing forward to what Peter explains here. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, right, was to show Christ, Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord is the Messiah, is the Savior, according to Apostle Peter. 
And down there, furthermore, we don't have time to open today, he talks about how, he says, I saw the Lord who is seated on God's right hand. He points it to how Jesus is the descendant of David. Namely, that Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, is Israel's true Messiah. He's the one, it's he, Prophet Joel says, those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. This is amazing. The Pentecost day, the coming of the Holy Spirit is not signs, wonders, and miracles, and tongues. This is the greatest sign, according to Peter. Men of Israel, he says, hear these words. There was no weird prophecy. Right? We see this in verse 22. Peter here is speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not pointing to his own spiritual experiences. He's pointing it to Jesus Christ from the scriptures. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. And so, what was the purpose of the mighty works, wonders, and signs that God did through Jesus? Verse 23 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified. He is not mincing his word. He points here his fingers to them and he says, You crucified Jesus with your sins. You killed him. <laughs> this is amazing. And this Jesus delivered according to the definite plan of God. He says, uh, He was killed by the hands of lawless men. And he says, This Jesus was delivered for you. And Peter says, this was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. I love this because if you're here today and you're wondering, what is God's plan for my life? God's definite plan for you is that you call upon him and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Peter says in verse 24, I love this. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death. And see, Jesus has suffered all the pains and all the sorrows of death for you. That's what it means, the pangs of death, the agonies of death. Jesus has suffered that and overcome that. If you're going through your most painful and lowest and darkest moments in your life, Jesus has overcome the pain and sorrows of death. Death could not hold him down because it says it was not possible for death to hold him down. <laughs> Peter says, it is not possible for Jesus to be held by death. Death had to give him up. This Jesus is what the Holy Spirit has come to show you and me today. The Holy Spirit has come to show us Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. David says, I see, I saw, I see the Lord always before me. Always before me, down there in that verse where he talks about Jesus in the Psalms. He's pointing to Jesus as the messianic king to the line of King David, Peter says. Amazing, right? So Pentecost is about Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. Keep reading the book of Acts and you will find that the greatest theme in the book of Acts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today, what does this mean for you and me? What does this mean for you and me? It means the Holy Spirit gives you life to those who call upon Jesus Christ. And with that new life comes a continuous infilling of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Present continuous tense in the original language. Be filled with the Spirit is a command. It's to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, Lily one morning came up to, one afternoon came up to me and says, so I do my devotions and I feel like my peace is leaking. And I need to go get the manna every day again to have that peace again. That's what it means to have that constant infilling of the Holy Spirit throughout the day. Learn to catch yourself walking in the flesh. Before you start to complain and there's irritability rising up, become self-aware. And notice that because when you're self-aware, the Holy Spirit often will point it out. But often we don't listen to the Holy Spirit because we, are, we have other voices that are louder. Our own voice and conscience is louder. The world's voice is louder. We don't listen very well. But Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit for which you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's direct scripture, right? means walking by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the lusts of the flesh wages war against the Spirit, and these are in contrary to one another. For you do not do the things that you wish you do, right? And you do the things that you really don't want to do. Why? There is a warfare within you. May I submit to you, with all respect, your majority of your problems in times of COVID-19 is not COVID-19 or the circumstances, it's your heart. 
Majority of the problems are inside you, and the Holy Spirit has come to liberate you from that. Jesus Christ has come. He's risen. The resurrection power of Christ is at work. He's called us to a life of repentance, renewal, and faith, so that we may walk with him. And he does that for our good. He loves us and gave himself for us. The Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says. Walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh along with its passions and its desire. That's what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of truth will come, He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the Holy Spirit. He convicts you. Conviction is different from condemnation. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. You are not condemned. The penalty has been paid. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. But that same chapter in Romans 8 also says about the walk of the Holy Spirit. That if we are led by the Spirit of God, he says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Are you paying attention to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? If you're a believer, you do. You ju you're just not aware. Some of you do. May I suggest to you that the fact that you're here today worshiping, even though you didn't feel like it, and you said to your feelings, shut up, and you came, that's how you walk by the Spirit. Some thoughts uh, that come against God comes in your mind, and your flesh doesn't want to do it, but then you tell your thoughts, shut up, I'm going to obey my Father. I love my Father. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So let us stand up and pray. There is more. He wants to really fill us. So the, being filled with the Spirit means that we learn to walk with Him, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. We miss it sometimes. But Jesus has walked the perfect walk. We couldn't walk. <laughs> Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. The law of the Spirit Jesus fulfills even the law of the Spirit. Jesus has measured up where we didn't measure up this week. Maybe you had a fight and a quarrel with somebody this week. Jesus measured up for you. Repent. You get to repent and not be condemned. Very, very wonderful thing. I get to confess and repent and not be condemned with the rest of the world. What grace, what grace he has given to us. Wherever you have failed in your sin, remember today, Jesus Christ measured up for you before the Father. This Jesus is the one the Holy Spirit has come to show us. So let us pray.